Hey everybody, Dr. Reviso here. In this video, we're gonna talk about innate immunity and then we'll touch on adaptive immunity in the next video. We really just wanna compare these two and see kind of what's similar, what's different, what type of cells are we talking about? And then we'll use this as an opportunity to transition a little bit, just kind of introduce antigen presentation and that whole process. And this is something that we're really gonna get the reps in on antigen presentation as we go through this video series to nail down a lot of these high yield facts and we'll keep kind of adding layers to it as we go. All right, so when we're talking about innate immunity, we're talking about non-specific response. So I think of this as like, you know, this is your standard defense. It's not really specific to a pathogen, right? It's just in general, these are our standard defense mechanisms. And I just want to say here with innate immunity, we're not just talking about cells in the bloodstream, for example. I mean, there's a lot of things, a lot of different defense mechanisms that your body has for the skin, for example, right? The skin is protecting us from interaction with bacteria that are on the surface of, you know, things that we're using every day, right? So our skin is going to be a defense mechanism, the gastric acid and the lumen of the stomach, that's a defense mechanism. So we have a lot of different defense mechanisms. When we're talking about questions in the immunology section, though, we're really gonna focus on the specifics here, particularly in the blood and in the tissue parenchyma. So like I said, for innate immunity, it's just like your standard defense, your mounting. Again, nonspecific, it's very rapid, right? As soon as you're exposed to a pathogen, you're gonna have a rapid uh, response. I, this is compared to adaptive immunity, right? In adaptive immunity, it takes time to build up that memory response for future exposures. Every response should be equal to the initial response. You're not gonna get any memory here with innate immunity. Immunity, okay, so that's important. Again, no memory with innate immunity, and all of this is juxtaposed again to adaptive immunity. Now, when you're talking about, okay, well, what kind of things would set off this innate immunity? What are some of the classic examples here? Okay, so let's just say that we have some immune cell here. Okay, so this is going to be our immune cell, and this immune cell is going to at some point interact with this bacteria. Now, let's just say, for example, that this bacteria is a gram negative bacteria. Maybe it's a gram negative rot, for example. Now, one of the features of gram negative rots is that they have lipopolysaccharide, right? They'll have LPS. Okay, so let's just say this has some LPS here. And so that LPS is an example of what we'll see as some kind of just general molecule that our body will recognize, right? Some type of pattern our body recognizes and says, hey, this is not good. This isn't something that is not supposed to be in the blood right now, right? It doesn't matter what type of bacteria it is. If it has LPS, the cells can recognize it. And that LPS is an example of one of these pathogen associated molecular patterns. Now, how do we actually recognize these patterns? Well, our cells, right, our immune cells will have on them receptors called pathogen recognition receptor. The PRRs, the pathogen recognition receptors, are gonna look for things like LPS, right? And this is being the pathogen associated molecular pattern. It's looking for some non-specific pattern that in general, no, the body knows this is not good. It doesn't tell you that it's a specific antigen with a specific epitope. It just recognizes things like LPS. And an example of a pathogen recognition receptor, the classic one to remember is gonna be the toll-like receptors, okay? The TLRs, toll-like receptors. And we have that written here, toll-like receptors. So the toll-like receptors can recognize things like LPS, for example. And so these pathogen recognition receptors can bind to these molecular patterns that some of these pathogens have, the classic one being LPS. And when they do that, they'll recognize that this is something that is not right. And so this is gonna set off the alarm bells, right? And so this is gonna generate some type of immune response, right? We're gonna release things like interleukin-1, which we'll talk about, TNF-alpha, right? We're just gonna generate some kind of inflammatory immune response, okay? That's the key. Another one here would be interleukin-8. Okay, so this is gonna generate some acute inflammatory response. Notice what I said, this was nonspecific, okay? It wasn't specific to one bacteria versus another, it's any bacteria that has lipopolysaccharide in their wall, it's rapid. As soon as it binds, we set off an acute inflammatory cascade. It's always gonna be pretty much equal, it's always the same, right? It's not gonna be different if I'm exposed one month versus another, okay? It's always gonna be the same, there's no memory to these receptors, we're just identifying a pattern that we know shouldn't be there potentially. Now, how do we go from this immune cell to releasing all of these different cytokines in the blood. There's one particular transcription factor out here in the cytoplasm. So we have NFKB, okay? So NFKB is gonna go from the cytoplasm into the nucleus, and that's gonna code for all of these kind of different acute inflammatory reactants. Okay, so that's how this whole process happens. So just to recap, right? So our immune cells in our blood, they have some nonspecific pathogen recognition receptors. The classic one here is the toll-like receptor. Of course, there's different variants of these, but these pathogen recognition receptors are going to identify pathogen-associated molecular patterns like LPS, like bacterial flagellin is actually another very classic one, viral nucleic acids. These are all very classic. So they're gonna recognize these. And so these immune cells will then bind using these receptors, bind to these patterns, 
And then that's going to cause NFKB, this transcription factor, to go into the nucleus and then encode for these acute inflammatory reactants. And we'll go through all of these uh, in the upcoming videos. Interleukin-1, TNF-alpha, interleukin-8 are all very classic. And these are the things that help stimulate the body to reset the hypothalamus set point, right? So you end up having a fever and we're generating an inflammatory response to kind of attack this infection. Again, very nonspecific, very rapid. Now, in the category of innate immunity, there's some different things that you want to be familiar with. How do we actually go about targeting this bacteria for destruction? What can we do to actually destroy this bacteria once we've recognized it? Well, the big thing here in our bloodstream, we have IgM. Now remember, IgM is an immunoglobulin. So IgM will actually bind specifically to its epitope. Okay, so we'll talk about this in the adaptive immunity section. However, IgM in general might just be floating around in the blood. IgM is going to kind of be like your standard immunoglobulin. So I want you to kind of think about it like your standard immunoglobulin. And the one thing that makes this different from some of these other things on here is that it actually is specific to one pathogen. Okay, so immunoglobulins in general are specific to a pathogen. However, IgM isn't involved in memory responses per se. It's just kind of your standard immunoglobulin that's gonna be released usually in an initial infection, okay? And then later on, we'll have class switching, right? When we have class switching, we can upgrade this to IgG, IgE, IgA, right? We'll talk about all of this in the next video. When IgM binds, it does bind specifically. So just keep that in mind. That's kind of tricky, but it's sometimes categorized here in the innate immune response because it doesn't involve class switching and having any type of memory response per se. Okay, the other things on here, complement membrane attack, complex C3B. We'll talk all about this. Lysozyme, which can uh, change the pH of some of these cells for destruction. Lactoferrin, also very classic. Um, so these are just things to be familiar with, part of the innate immune response. And then the respiratory burst pathway, which we'll talk about in great detail in a video to come up on neutrophils. By the way, this thing that we're looking at here, this is going to be a neutrophil. Okay, so we're looking at a neutrophil. And I'll talk about how to distinguish these in just a second. But this neutrophil, how is this neutrophil going to attack this bacteria with this innate immune response using some of these things we talked about? So the first thing this neutrophil can do is it can use phagocytosis, okay? So thinking of the Pac-Man, right? This neutrophil can eat up this bacteria. And once it eats up this bacteria, it can take the components of that bacteria and put that into phagolysosomes, okay? So it can put it into phagolysosomes. And then it can use chemicals like lysozyme to try to break down the components of this bacteria, right? as it's digesting it. The other thing that it can do is it can use the oxidative burst pathway, which is what we we're just talking about. So it can use the respiratory burst pathway to generate things like superoxide radicals, hydrogen peroxide, to essentially break down the components of the bacteria. So the key is with neutrophils, we have phagocytosis, right? They can use chemicals like lysozyme, for example, and they can also use the respiratory burst pathway, oxidative burst, to help break down these bacteria components. Now, the key thing that you wanna remember though, with neutrophils, neutrophils do not present these bacterial antigens to other cells. That's important. Okay. And that's going to be different from some of these other cells down here, which we'll talk about in just a second. So in general, when my neutrophil in the blood runs into this bacteria, that neutrophil can engulf it. It can try to digest it using phagolysosomes and the respiratory burst pathway. As this is happening, right, this acute inflammatory response occurring, the bone marrow is going to increase the number of neutrophils. It's going to say, hey, we need more of these neutrophils. We need more of these guys so they can go eat more bacteria. The bone marrow just starts pumping out neutrophils. And in the process of doing that, it's also going to release some immature neutrophils. And these are sometimes called band cells. Okay, so these immature neutrophils are called band cells. And I'll talk about this a lot in the hemonic section. But this is why if a patient has you know, an infection or bacteremia, for example, you can use criteria like the amount of band cells that the patient has, or the percent band cells, to help give you a higher conviction that the patient has an infection. Remember, we talked about SIRS criteria, right? Having a high percentage of band cells would suggest an infection. And so that's what's happening. As we're pumping out more of our neutrophils, as well as some of the other uh, cells here, like the eosinophils, for example. So this is an, an example of an eosinophil. So notice the eosinophils, they're going to stain pink, okay? So eosinophils in general stain pink. Again, we have this, the multi-lobed nucleus here with eosinophils, multi-lobed nucleus here with neutrophils. And that's kind of why the neutrophils, the eosinophils, basophils are all classified as PMNs. The P is polymorphonuclear, right? Polymorphonuclear. They're going to have multiple lobes in their nuclei, right? And so that's what we see again, eosinophils staining pink, and you can see the neutrophils staining a little bit lighter blue in their cytoplasm. 
Um, and then here we have a basophil. Okay, so I'll do this one in blue. Okay, so the basophil, you can see this one's staining a little bit deeper uh, blue. And just to keep things simple, I don't want to go into too much detail on this here, but the basophil, like the eosinophil, they're both seen in parasitic infections. Uh, the basophil, more classic for allergic reactions overall, and the eosinophil, more classic for parasitic infections. But you can see basophils with parasitic infections as well. The thing about basophils sometimes gets overlooked. They're non-phagocytic, so they're not going to be digesting bacteria. Eosinophils, on the other hand, can do that. And the mast cells we sometimes see with allergic reactions, mast cells usually will not have multiple lobes to their nucleus, like you see here with the basophil, like you see here with the eosinophil. Uh, mast cells are not included in that PMN category. So all of these cells are going to be getting pumped out usually when we have some kind of inflammatory cascade, like we talked about. All started up here when that immune cell used its pathogen recognition receptor to run into, in this case, LPS being one of the pathogen associated molecular patterns causing interleukin 1, TNF alpha interleukin 8 to get released because NFKB, the transcription factor, coded for them as this interaction took place between the pathogen recognition receptor and the PAMP. All right, just a couple other things here. So the monocyte, so this cell is a monocyte. Okay, so the monocytes sometimes can be tricky to differentiate from some of these other cells. So the monocytes usually have more of a horseshoe kind of appearance. Uh, to their nuclei. That's classically how it's um, described. Now the monocytes, remember the monocytes are primarily going to be in the bloodstream. Once these monocytes get into tissues, when they migrate into tissues, they're going to become macrophages. And those macrophages, just like the neutrophil, they can go into that tissue and they, they can use phagocytosis to try to digest the bacteria. And the difference between the macrophages and the neutrophils is the macrophages actually can take the antigens from the bacteria and put them on the cell surface to present them to other cells. So we'll see that in the next slide. Now monocytes don't just turn into macrophages, they can turn into dendritic cells, which are also antigen presenting cells. So just keep that in mind. When we talk about antigen presenting cells, the dendritic cell is kind of like the poster child for that whole process. So remember, dendritic cells can come from monocytes as well. Then we also have things like natural killer cells, which I'll talk a lot more about uh, when we start to talk about major histocompatibility complex and that type of thing. So we won't go into too much detail on that here. Um, but again, all of this is part of your innate response and checks a lot of the boxes that you see up here. So just to recap this, the primary function here is rapid. That's important. It's a very rapid recognition and hopefully a resolution of some new infectious agent. Now, when I say new here, it doesn't mean that we weren't previously exposed to that infectious agent. It just means that we're now exposed to that infectious agent. It's a new infectious agent. It hasn't been around for a long time, right? It's not a chronic infection. It's something that we were just exposed to and now rapidly recognizing it and then attempting resolution of that infection particularly effective versus fungi and parasites. And we'll talk more about why that is as we proceed here. That's not to say that innate immunity doesn't work against bacteria or viruses. It just isn't as effective. And the last thing here is that this is all germline encoded. So what are we talking about germline encoded? That means that the innate immune response can vary from one person to the next person. But the key is, is that this whole process in the innate immune system is not gonna change over time. Once you have your genetics, for innate immunity, that's it. That's what you got, okay? It's not gonna get better, it's not gonna get worse. I mean, it, over time, right, as we age, our, our ability to respond to infections kind of comes down a little bit for other reasons, but in general, we're not gonna generate more memory responses or anything like that. Remember, this is no memory response. It's equal to the initial response. It's always gonna be the same. So whatever you have that's germline encoded, that's what you're gonna have pretty much for the rest of your life. And so this all develops in utero, when we're still a fetus, is when this whole process is gonna form, which is gonna be different from what we talk about in the adaptive immune system in just a minute. So this is all inherited from mom and dad. And the last thing I just wanna to touch on here, I kind of brushed over this, but really quickly, we talk about these neutrophils as polymorphonuclear cells. Here you can see that this neutrophil has three lobes. And sometimes people say, well, how do I tell a neutrophil from a monocyte, right? So the neutrophils, like we said, are gonna usually have multiple lobes. Classically, neutrophils will have three to four lobes. Most of the time, they're gonna have three. If you see a cell that looks like a neutrophil, but it has like six lobes, remember that's a very classic for megaloblastic anemia, okay? So think about folic acid deficiency, B12 deficiency. I just wanna remind you of that. Um, I think I wanted to talk about that, but I forgot to bring it up. But that's particularly important when you're looking at these cells, because you have to distinguish these. Remember, eosinophils stain pink, basophils are going to stain darker blue, mast cells will not be PMNs, neutrophils with more than five to six lobes. Now you're starting to think about B12 deficiency, monocytes classically with more of the horseshoe appearance, and then it's going to have a, usually have a higher nuclear to cytoplasm ratio. Okay, so just keep all of that in mind when you're looking at these cells. We're going to talk about them more in HEMOC, but I just wanted to cover that here.